Hi, Annette. Hi, Fred. How are you doing? 
Good. Um, did Randy Smith get a hold of you today? No, not that I'm aware of. I don't see an email. I didn't get any phone call that I checked. What's up? Well, as we were walking out of the house to go to the early service, the phone rang and I answered it and it was Randy. He was all apologetic because Reggie had asked him to contact us about looking through the safe for any of the, the love offerings to Lauren that may be there because he wanted oh. to give them to her today. Right. And I said to Randy, I'm sorry, but I don't have the key to the safe. I'm going to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned that you did have it. Mm -hmm. And if he could catch you, you know, <laughs> good luck at such a late time. Oh. I don't know when this request was made of Randy, but he really barely sneaked under the <laughs> within <laughs> seconds. <laughs> so okay. I gather just uh, tomorrow it'll get resolved tomorrow morning. I guess so. Is your is your kitchen done? The kitchen is done. Uh, we're going to be doing a check off tomorrow. It's not totally awesome. done. So it's not totally done. We have some under counter lights to be installed and to touch up paint here and there. And an outlet to, to go in yet uh, in one of the yeah. cabinets. Other than that, it should tomorrow. It really should be finished if, if they get on it and, and do the check off. But we also found out that uh, Tuesday, they're going to be in our bathroom tearing it apart. <laughs> oh, out of the frying so pan the, into the fire. Yes, the bedlam continues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so will you be at Tellers in the morning? Or when is your I, final I think walk? I, bet, I think I'm going to have to pass on it and, and okay. leave it to you guys again. Okay. Uh, the only thing I know about that's going to be a little unusual is there's going to be some chili checks in there. Chili. Uh, curmudgeons okay. made chili for the uh, for Patty and in, in what is it called? The Lamb Center. The Lamb Center. Oh, like, okay. Sixty some quarts, and uh, there's a little bit of leftover that we let some of the widows have that, that were recent, and uh, right. So there's some checks from them, and you'll see it. Okay. I put it all in, and I don't know what Bob Bob may have put some into. Okay. So. That's the only thing unusual that I know about, as well as yeah. the checks, or what checks or cash may be in there for long. Okay. All right. We'll get it. And it looks like that uh, Bob is going to squeak in here, <laughs> maybe under the, he still has a minute. <laughs> I wonder where he is. Yeah. I'm going to pull up my handouts here. Ed, uh, you're, I'm, I'm unmuted. But you, okay, uh, we. I'm happy to report to you, Ed, that everything worked in the kitchen uh, Friday when we cooked chili. <laughs> the warming trays worked beautifully. The oven, I mean, the oven worked fine. The range, and we were afraid when we went in. 
in all those years that it's not being used very much, that something might be amiss, but everything worked perfectly. We actually did find a couple of things that didn't work because they've been sitting too long, but glad it was nothing else. Yeah. The disposal was completely frozen. Is Denise home yet? Denise? Yeah, what wasn't she at uh Faith Community Nurse Training? Oh yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, I thought I thought you said she on yet. Uh, no, yes, yeah, she just got home an hour ago. Okay. Had a good time. Good, good. Hi guys, we're having a small technical difficulty, which we'll work our way through. We we have you only a small computer screen size as opposed to the big monitor that's here, but we'll make that work. All right, so let me get started. I don't know what to do to get that large. See. You can make it work, sir. You might be able to. Got Isn't the right it, input. Wouldn't it be a part of the PC? It is. No, it's it because you're in. You're on the inputs for the TV. So, inputs. See, it's on HDMI three. That's you see where it is. Yeah. These are inputs to the television. Give it a second. Let's see what we got. All right. All right. Chris is going to play with that. While he's doing that, uh, you say we get started. I can still see you all on the computer. And hopefully, you can see us. Okay. We have Chris and Denise here, and Barbara and Penny. I think that's going to be it. That's a couple of people, you know, Steve is still quarantined. You probably heard that he got uh, got COVID. And uh, I think Pete and Karen are pretty well dropped out. Uh, I don't know about other people. I don't. Ed Settle didn't indicate whether he was going to be here or not, so I don't know what he's what he's doing. I'm here, Bob. Oh, you're on the screen. Ah, yeah. sorry, Ed. I can't see you very well, so we my apologies. Yeah. No problem. I don't think live TV is the right answer. It, it is not. But no, but the PC is down there, Steve. Yeah, but we can't get to. There it goes. Wait a minute. Yeah, you. you Maybe the, percussive maintenance. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> percussive no, I maintenance. To, I love that term. There you go. Hey, good. That's an improvement. Just make it full screen. Now, if you go up to the top, make it yeah full screen, please. Yep. There we go. Look Thank you, Chris. You. Yep. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're in charge. Oh, don't you don't want to do that? <laughs> okay. Um, if you'll allow me, I'm going to steal a prayer from uh, from the uh, service this morning. Okay. If if you have not, I don't know how many of you went to the service or are going to try to watch it online. Um, there appears to be a glitch in our website that you can't simply go to it. So if you want to watch it, uh, the service for the online service for this week, let me know and I'll give you the link. You have to put the link in your browser to get to it. But we'll have to figure out at the beginning of the week why, why we can't get to it the way we used to. <clears throat> anyway, allow me to, to offer an opening prayer. But first of all, are there any prayer requests? Anybody have any particular requests? Yes, please. Fred, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute. Uh, I think we can uh, pray for all those who are coming down with COVID because it seems like it's really running rampant uh, in yeah. the area. Uh, we just heard that a fairly large percentage of the West Springfield group that gave some type of performance recently after it was over, about a third of them came down with COVID, and oh, we're hearing, right. yeah, we're hearing more and more of that. So, uh, prayers that uh, people will be careful and uh, avoid it in some way, and if they get it, they can get the meds they need to, to get it before it gets you. Okay. Anybody else have anything? 
Uh, I don't know if you heard, but Jane Stottlemyre, apparently her knee surgery was successful, Lois. Yeah, yeah, as far as okay. I know. I don't so, you know, she, she has significant COPD in addition to this, but at least she can get around now. And they've had her up and moving within a couple hours, I think, as I understand the story, Lois. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's, that's wonderful. Anybody else have anybody in their family that they're specifically praying for? We certainly want to continue to pray for the poor folks in Ukraine and you know, and the, the fallout from that, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news, but because Ukraine was always a very large exporter of, of grain, of wheat and canola oil and things like that, uh, if they don't start getting out, a lot of places that they were selling to, particularly in Africa, countries in Africa, could face starvation. So it, it's a real problem. Okay, and we hope that somehow that can all get resolved and those is that we don't need that problem on top of everything else. So unfortunately, I was watching a video today from BBC News about the Russian destruction of the grain silos. Oh, good lord. Is that right? Yeah. I know they stole a lot of the grain. They put it in the wrong ships and tried to sell it. Yeah. But they but, also yeah. you know, flat out. It seems want, the silos and want destruction of property just for no good reason. They want to take over the country. They're going to have nothing but rubble. Yep. Okay, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Anyway, uh, anybody else? Okay. We're starting our political circus this already with the with the uh, primaries. And we'll be going through this for the next several months. It's what we do every two years as a country. And it's always, always good for a little amusement. So we'll pray for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this opportunity to come together and in fellowship, knowing that you promised when two or three were gathered in your name, you would be with us. We ask, Lord, as we conclude our uh, study of, of the Gospels and Acts, that you would open our minds to, to various things and, and help us to better understand what those particular books of the Bible have to say to us. We ask that you give us the curiosity and the patience and the stick to 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 try to understand all that's here because it's just it's so complex and so profound that it's oftentimes difficult for us to grasp it we ask lord that you would consider those that we have mentioned today uh, specific individuals and obviously groups including all of those people who suddenly seem to be contracting covid we just hope lord that they will get through this. Uh, hopefully, that the predictions for COVID uh, in the fall, when they're talking about 100 million people getting it, hopefully, that's just in this country, then hopefully that will turn out to be overly pessimistic. Pessimistic. And we just know, Lord, that, that you know, as we're seeing outbreaks around the world, that, that uh, we, we just hope somehow that we can bring this under control and, and not lose so many lives. We ask, Lord, that you be with us today as we consider your holy word. Holy, holy God, the, first, the earth is full of your glory, and so we worship you. And our hearts are on fire with the awareness that Christ is with us. We thank you. So make your presence known to us. When our fears are calmed in the bright light of resurrection day, we praise you. So calm our fears. Let us abide forever in the assurance of your love through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> okay. As I said, as advertised, uh, we're going to do two things, two of which have, relate to the handouts, and the other is going to be free form. The first of those is post resurrection. Again, in the same spirit of looking at the Gospels comparatively, okay, we're turning our attention to the final portions of each of the Gospels. Okay, uh, we did, of course, you know, the, the, the uh, Last Supper and then, the, and then the trial before the Sanhedrin. We did all that last week and so forth. We now find ourselves looking after Sunday or starting with Sunday. Um, I would invite your attention just briefly, if you have a copy to hand out, you're, you're, you're that much ahead or 
let me say that I started the handout with a couple of references to the Old Testament. The first is the uh, definition of what they call the scapegoat. The scapegoat was a, was a concept it was in uh, Leviticus 16, verses 21 and 22, in which two unblemished lambs would be brought in. One would be sacrificed. The other, this of course only occurred once a year. The other would be have all the sins of the Israelites piled on it, okay, by the by the uh, chief priest, and then they would take that scapegoat and send it out into the wilderness, okay, to live with its own fate. I bring that up simply because that's of course one of the aspects that we think about Jesus, with all the sins of the world being piled upon him, okay, at the time of his crucifixion. And, you know, it, that concept is so powerful, it's kind of difficult sometimes to grasp that he took on everything. I don't know how many of you saw the, uh, the, the uh, what was it called? It was a movie about 10 years ago or more about, about that, about, uh, oh shoot, I'm not thinking of the title of it right now. But the point is that it shows Jesus in the garden Okay, crying, you know, and, and asking to be relieved of this particular burden. And the devil is, is teasing him, saying, in, in effect, you know, you didn't sign up for this, did you? You know, to the take passion on of the Christ. passion of the Christ. Thank you. That's what I was thinking. Yes. And I don't know if you, if you saw it, that scene was very powerful. Okay, as you stop to think about it. And, uh, you know, just it reminded me of, of this. The other part of it, of course, is the so-called Day of Atonement, the day in which, again, under the Old, Old Testament tradition, in which I believe is still true today, you know, in, in Jewish uh, understanding, that one day a year, they atone for all of the people, okay? And that one day of the year, you're supposed to not do any work, you're supposed to just devote yourselves to the, to the Lord, and, you know, in essence, that's what we do on Good Friday. I mean, Good Friday, in many senses, is, is, is that same thing where we're looking at the atonement that Jesus made for all of us. And, you know, something. Anyway, moving on, moving on to the New Testament. Uh, as I've done in the previous things, I've tried to pick topics and see how the Gospels collectively speak to them. The first of these topics is the predictions about Jesus post-resurrection. Now, you know, we, we in looking back from the 21st century, sort of take it for granted that Jesus will rise again on the third day. But remember, when we look at it from the perspective of the folks in first century Palestine, who, he hasn't yet risen, okay? What, what were they expecting? And it, what's amazing is the number of different passages where it's predicted that he'll rise after, third, after three days. Okay? This is not just a, a concept that we look at now. Jesus himself said repeatedly, I stress that, Jesus himself said repeatedly that he would have to be killed and he would rise again on the third day. So that's something to think about. Uh, and if you have your handout or if you look at it later, you'll see there are, there are a whole series of them, starting, for example, uh, in Matthew 16, verse 21. And on the third day, be raised to life. I'm reading, obviously, the last part of that. Okay? Then um, I would say in, in Matthew uh, 20, verse 19, on the third day, he will be raised to life, and so on and so on. There are a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven passages in the Gospels in which Jesus predicted that he will be raised. So we start with that presumption. If Jesus said that was going to happen, and then we as we go to the empty tomb, we know that's what did happen. It's something to ponder. I mentioned one particular outlier in that particular group, John 12. 32, and when I am up, and this is Jesus speaking, it's red print again, and 
and when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Something to think about. He made this prediction that he would draw us all to him. So that's something that's okay. Then we go on next to the to one of the passages that shows up in all four gospels, where where the Jesus is in front of the Sanhedrin in, in the three synoptic gospels and in front of the former high priest Annas in John. And he's asked, is he the son of God? Is he the Messiah? And his response, you say I am. But more importantly, from, from now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. That idea of sitting on the right hand of God. Think about that for just a minute. That's a pretty powerful statement for this, this itinerant preacher to make. I mean, it seems obvious to, uh, to us here looking back from the 21st century, but imagine how that was perceived in his time, talking to the Jewish officials, the Jewish religious leaders. He's, he's saying, I'm going to sit at the right hand of God. No wonder they tore their clothes. No wonder, yes. They, and of course, they ripped their clothes. That's exactly right, right? You have the timer set to turn it off. We got these silly machines we have, right? But just think about that. That's a, that's something that that we sort of gloss over. But he, you know, he's he's making that statement that he's going to sit at the right hand of God. You know, and that's a form of blasphemy because being at the right hand of God is essentially being God. And you know, they're saying, "How dare you say this? And who do you think you are?" Okay, that, that brings us then to the empty tomb, which of course is what we celebrate, let's say if we have an Easter sunrise service or even in our services here at the church. Notice that all four gospels talk about him rising, him not being in the tomb. Now in Matthew, there's an additional section that talks about the guards. Remember that the priests, had, had asked the Romans to put guards on the tomb so that nobody could steal the body. And when the guards discover that Jesus is gone, they know that first and foremost, they're liable to get, get their throats cut for, for dereliction of duty. They must have been asleep, right? Somebody sneaked in and got and got Jesus. Well, for them to admit that they were asleep, they're asking them to admit they were asleep. Right. Not, not just have them presume they were asleep. And Tell them you were asleep and they came and got him. Okay. You were sleeping so deeply you kind of missed it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, it's like. And they gave, you money. they gave the guards money to, to the tell sentence, this story. The sentence for falling asleep on duty was death. It still is. <laughs> well, I don't know if it is in the American army, but certainly <laughs> it is. It was in the Roman army. But No, I agree. I'm, I'm exaggerating. Obviously. But, but it's a pretty serious thing fall asleep on duty yes so again we're looking at that you know and the other thing we notice is that in every single case all four of the gospels the first people to find out about the tomb being empty are the women and they go and tell people and they're not believed because they're women or because, it because is they're such women a, such a fantastic change well yeah, yes and yes both, obviously. Well, but, it would have been logical for them to assume that the women were hysterical. Hysterical. Whatever it was they saw, they were hysterical. And it couldn't have been that he wasn't there, that he had risen. They and, wouldn't have believed that. And remember, in that time, women were not allowed to testify in court. They were, they were considered unreliable. That was the, the you know, the, the society that they were living in. Hard to process. Yeah, that's hard in the 21st century in America. Isn't that's incomplete. Now they're they're trying to do that in the Taliban in Afghanistan. Okay. So I have a question before we go ahead, go please. On before the, the when we were talking before about Christ having predicted to his to the apostles that he he would be killed mm -hmm. and that he would rise again. I don't read. I don't remember remember hearing anything that 
suggest that they were mollified or in any way that with the thought that he would rise again. They're all grief stricken that he will be killed. That's correct. They and kind then, of missed the other part of it. Right. And I'm yes. just wondering, was it even to them fantastic, too fantastic to to think that that could be? Well, most of the okay, this is my opinion. Most of what he told them, he told them in parables. Mm -hmm. So for me, it would be logical for them to presume. Oh, it's a it's this an is, allegory. This is an story. allegory. This is a well, parable. If you look at the passages, they're not parables. They're barely dry. right. I understand that. I understand that. But if if for but just the last three so, years, so almost everything, statement. right? If if in the last three years, every something, every time he told you something, it was pretty much. A parable or an allegory or something Lazarus. like that. So it shouldn't, it wouldn't be, it shouldn't be surprising that to them, well, but at the same time, I can understand they're they're either not getting it or so they probably just over lost it over. Glossed over it. They yeah. absolutely I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to well, you remember Peter says that's not gonna happen. Yeah. And he says, get behind me. Yes, go ahead, please. So there's two other points. One is um, the high priests feared this story from spreading, which is why they had the guards yes. there. They wanted to make sure that nobody stole his body and then claimed that he had rich one is really dead. Right. <laughs> so that's that's part one. Yes. But the other argument that I would make is that there are several points where God has intentionally muddied the memory or muddied the, you know, vision of well, like Pharaoh, the apostles. Right? Times Pharaoh's heart. Not not just that, but yes. they're about to walk to Emmaus. Yes. And they walk oh, yes. Jesus all oh, the way to man. Emmaus, but don't realize that. that it's actually him. Yeah. Until the until they break the, bread. Until so they break bread. The mm -hmm. same kind of thing, you know. They and and they may have been told. You know, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to rise on the third day. Well, the death part they're very familiar with. The whole rising on the third day. I think I think you have a point. Is he just speaking metaphorically that he's going to rise? But you know, they also had the you know evidence of Lazarus. They had the sick girl that was healed, things like that. But still, there wasn't I think a full belief. I mean, point out death is pretty. Yeah, let me point out a subtlety. He never said, I will rise. He said, I will be raised. Okay. Very important difference. Yeah. Okay. So he's and not the one doing it. He's, he's, he's talking yeah. about what God's doing. Yeah. And if you remember the whole story of Lazarus, that he waited so that they could see. And he says to his disciples, so you can see God's glory. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It wasn't his glory. It was what God can do. But yeah. I can if see them not faith. understanding that too. Oh, absolutely. Because what they saw at Lazarus' tomb was Jesus standing there saying, Lazarus, come out of there. When he first prayed to God. Right. And, and they, they, probably, not, they probably didn't hear that. Yes. But, but right. he's standing there going, you know, I can see them thinking, oh, he did that. Can he do it for himself? And, and well, they say or, that on the cross, don't they? Yes. You? Save yourself. Right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And or a concept of, well, maybe he wasn't fully dead. Right. And that is one of the things that, you know, comes up as well. You know, the arguments by the historians and things like that is that, well, maybe he was just, as to put it in the, you know, province of the Princess Bride, mostly dead. Yes. <laughs> I was thinking about that. I love it. You know, well, even wasn't it um, the pilot that was surprised that they had, the guards had taken him down off the cross so soon? Right. Because it, typically it took a, a lot, lot of yeah. days. To yeah, and they break their legs in order to speak. Well, right. you remember it says that when they come right. back, that, you know, they check and he, he was already dead and they, you know, poked him in the, in the size of the spear. Right. And water and blood came Because they were going to break his leg. They were going to break his leg. And then they necessary. realized he was already dead. So right. they did because, and that fulfilled the prophecy that yeah. Yeah. his bones would not be broken. Anyway, let's move yeah. on. Yeah. We're at the point of the empty tomb. And the various stories, the four stories, okay, the women, you know, Mary Magdalene, it seems to be there each time, and in some cases his mother, other people, uh, Joanna, but 
they all see and they go and tell the, the men. Peter, Peter is, always seems to be one of the ones running to the tomb. Okay. And the question, you know, he goes in and he's totally, you know, perplexed by what has happened. And remember that in none of these do, do these stories do the men actually see Jesus at this time. It's only Mary Magdalene that actually sees Jesus in person. Okay. In one of the, in one of the particular accounts. And so, you know, so they, they're, what they've got is an empty tomb. They're right, really not entirely sure what to make of it. Go ahead, please. I was, I was just going to tie one other thing off, which is you mentioned Peter and the fact that he denied Jesus three times. And it says in the verse there that suddenly the cock crows and Peter remembered. Right. You know what Jesus said. Well, that was when they were, he was being tried by the Senate. I kind of have that same kind Absolutely. of thing of don't worry, I'll be killed, but you know, I will be raised. And it's like, you know, until they actually see him later, they suddenly remember, oh, that's right, he told us this would happen. So the, the third day, or the cock crowing three times in the third day, is this go back to your question from last week about the power three, of three? The power of three. The cock, cock crowed once in uh, several of the Gospels. And three twice. of the Gospels. It oh, wasn't the cock, not the cock crowing, but Mark, Tim denied. Three times. Yeah. Nine, three times, yeah. But again, that's, that's back on Thursday evening. Okay. But but her question is is that another symbolism of the well, number three? Like, I don't know the answer to that question. It's a good question. I just don't know the answer. We have to check those comments. Yes. Anyway, we we we've, we've gotten to the empty two. Let's move on. We're still in the same hand. I'm now on page three. Okay. Uh, notice at the top of page three, I've given you a couple of passages out of Acts that refer to this same event. Okay. In other words, Acts does speak about this event, about the empty tomb, and about the risen Lord. There, you know, in addition to the Gospels themselves, it's discussed in Acts. So, uh, in several places, and it, you know, it, it, you know, I'm just going to read from the very last passage. But the one whom God, whom God raised from the dead, did not see decay. Even though he was buried for thir three days in the tomb lent to him by uh, yeah, Joseph of Arimathea. Okay. But, you know, so just you know, be thinking, That's what I'm trying to get in your mind is to realize that this whole concept is so, so amazing, so fantastic. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. No, it hasn't. It was certainly fantastic to them. And they had trouble understanding. And, and of course, we don't have the benefit of actually seeing the empty tomb. I don't know how many of you have been to Jerusalem, but they take you to the garden tomb. It's one of the tourist things they do. Okay. And, was, and it's still, it's shown in a lot of videos, the tomb in the garden, where they, you know, which could have been the, the real tomb, who knows? Okay? But it certainly gives you a sense of it. That brings us to the next, here's what we've had done now. We've, we've seen the prediction of his rising, We've seen the empty tombs, and now we're going to look at his appearances. Okay, starting in the middle of page three. Okay, I've listed the various places where we talk about appearances. I happen to start with Matthew 28, with the Great Commission, where he comes and appears to his disciples. But that's just, I've tended to list things in the order the Gospels are in the Bible. That's not necessarily the order, exact order of events. I just didn't know any better. But you see that you start right there, you've got that appearance. And it, I've given you a, a, a thing out of Isaiah 66. Okay, about, you know, the, the, remember, Isaiah is sometimes referred to as the fifth gospel. In so many ways, is it relevant to the story? So that's why I, from time to time I've included quotes from Isaiah. At the bottom of page three, we see Mark and the appearances that he, he deals with. Okay. It says, first of all, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. And that's, by the way, where we see that she apparently had been, had seven demons driven out. That's where that particular story comes from. 
then he goes on in the top of page four to talk about appearing to two of them. Now, it's kind of vague. And we'll see that the, the road to Emmaus is actually in Luke. But this is Mark's kind of abbreviated version of that story of two, two people. And then he appears to the 11. As it says, I'm looking at uh, verse uh, 14 at the top of the page there. Later, Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn, stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had re risen. So they're still fighting the problem. They're still, they're not believing that this is even possible. And he has to, you know, he has to use the proverbial two by four to get their attention. Okay, then we go on to, to Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. Now we're familiar with this story where Jesus, a couple of, uh, two or three disciples, I think it's three disciples, or, no, it's two, two disciples are walking. Emmaus is a village outside of Jerusalem. And they're walking and he, he just kind of shows up and starts walking with them and talking to them. And it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He was trying to tie back to the Old Testament all of the scriptures that were relevant to his to Jesus and where he is now. And then, as you pointed out, he doesn't recognize, they don't recognize him initially. You know, here, just like if you remember the story of, in, in John, where Mary's at the tomb. And initially, he, she sees Jesus and doesn't recognize who he is and thinks he's, you know, a gardener or something. Where have you taken? It's the same thing. As you pointed out, you know, Jesus could make it possible for people not to see if it served his purposes. Okay. And then, of course, he, you know, he goes like through. We just, if I can interrupt, he, like we just discussed, they wouldn't be predisposed to think of, of being able to see him. No, no. That's so far into their thinking. Okay. Yeah. Well, why, you know, why would they think to see him because he was dead? Right. That's my point. Dead. Yeah. And when he, you're dead, you're dead, right? You know, to them, when you're, you're dead, dead, you're dead. You're not coming back. <laughs> and that's what's amazing about this story. Okay. And then, of course, at the end, as he's having having a meal with them, somehow magically, when he breaks the bread, which of course points back to the Last Supper, doesn't it? When he breaks the bread, they suddenly realize who they're with. And he gets up, he disappears. Yep. He doesn't walk away, he just disappears. Okay. And they rush back to Jerusalem to tell the, tell the other disciples what happened. And that happens earlier as well. Um, the whole disappearing act. Not disappearing act per se, but people not recognizing him because they tried to arrest him at the temple before but his time had not yet come and he, you know, just kind of walked through the crowd and disappeared. Right. Yes. There are several places in scripture that talk like that. Yeah. They tried to stone him one time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he just quietly disappeared. Right. Because he was in control. We don't have that kind of control in our world. No. So. Anyway. Then, it, then he appeared down at the bottom of page four. He appears to the disciples. Okay, again, he just comes through the door and appears to them. And of course, they're totally, you know, must flummoxed. Yeah. What, what's going Yeah, it must be a ghost, right? And he, you know, and then he asked for something to eat. That theme of eating with the disciples is a very important one. We'll see in just a minute. And he reminds them of, of what, so this is what was what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. So he reminds them that he's been telling them this. He wasn't just making it up. Okay, and he appears to Mary Magdalene. This is, the, this is in John, as I've already mentioned, when she comes to the tomb. Initially, she doesn't recognize him. And then he says to her, Mary, and she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, 
which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. That's, you know, that's a pretty powerful statement. Then we get, you know, he shows here, uh, John 24, 19, 20, he appears to the disciples. But Thomas, doubting Thomas, wasn't there. So he comes back again at a time when Thomas is there. Again, this is all familiar to you. But, but it, as you lay it out with all these, these various examples side by side, you begin to get a different, a slightly different image than if you look at them individually. Okay? He came, okay? What does Thomas say? Thomas says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I, I will not believe. So Jesus comes back. Peace be with you. Then he says, to then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God, Think about that. He's not only saying Jesus is the Messiah, but he's saying he's God. Something, you know. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That applies to us in the 21st century. Okay. That brings me to, to John 21. Okay. John 21, where he all of the group is up there in Galilee. They're out fishing all night. They don't, they're not catching anything. They come in early in the morning and they see this person on the shore. Initially, they don't know who it is. He tells them to put down their nets. And they catch an enormous catch. And all of a sudden, John, the, the disciple John says, it's the Lord. And Peter puts on his cloak and jumps into the water and wades in to meet Jesus on the shore. And one thing about Peter is he's not, he's not a neutral kind of guy. He, he, he definitely gets involved, even if he is just a mere fisherman. And then in the end of that passage at the bottom of page five, okay, we see the whole thing where he reinstates Peter. And he, and he does it, as you pointed out, Chris, he does it three times. Do you love me? Peter says, yes. Feed my sheep. Okay. Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. And finally, he asks him a third time. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Who's he talking about? Us. Us. Right? We are the sheep. As it says in Isaiah, we all like sheep have gone astray. That's, I know that because that's in Messiah. If you haven't heard that, that's one of the choruses, part of one of the choruses in Messiah. Anyway, so the next thing that happens is the ascension. After all these appearances, and notice, by the way, right at the top of page five, I've quoted two that are very familiar from 1 Corinthians, okay? He appeared to more than 500, top of page five. Six. I'm sorry, five, thank you, top of page six. Yeah, I, I please know it. Hey, that worked for you? We are but one step away all of us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, he appeared to more than 500. That's the famous passage that says, you know, in addition to the individual things of being this, of course, is written by Paul. It's worth noting this particular letter was probably written substantially before the Gospels. So this is really the first statement about it. it's not in chronological order. In other words, we know that 1 Corinthians was one of the early letters that Paul wrote. And so, and it was written before the first Gospel. So as chances are that it's, you know, that this is the first of case of talking about the appearances of Jesus. Okay, that takes me to uh, the ascension. Wait, just a minute. Please. 
1 Corinthians 15, 8, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Paul's talking about himself. Okay. I, but I don't understand why he refers to himself as I don't know the abnormally answer. born. I, that's, and it's a good question, but I weird. unfortunately don't know the answer. I never yeah. noticed that before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the I think it's it's his humility. I don't, you know, he seems to be fundamentally a very humble person. Mm -hmm. I think that's his way of being self deprecating. Okay. Well, also keeping in mind that, you know, Paul has Saul. He did everything he could to destroy the church. He did. And he may be referring to himself as when he says that normally born there, some sort of mental retardation or you know, something like that. It like, took I, him a while I was, to see. I wasn't even smart enough to realize the truth of this thing until yeah. he showed up in front of me and you hit know, me over the head with a two by four. Almost yeah. literally. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we Thank see. You. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. I no, that's all. That's all I wanted to ask. I've included the, the one other passage in scripture that talks about somebody being taken up into heaven. Uh, in 2 Kings, okay, where it talks about Elijah being taken up on a chariot of fire. Okay, okay so that's the only other passage in scripture that, ha that has that particular. Anyway, going on from there, the whole series of passages and notice not all the gospels talk about ascension we know that that in in matthew the last the last chapter of matthew is the great commission it does not say that jesus was taken up at that point in time even though that could have been applied and the same is true of john the last chapter of john in chapter 21 it doesn't say specifically that jesus was taken up but notice that I've also included a passage from Acts where it talks about where Peter is talking about the ascension of Jesus. Notice in, in verse 9, about two-thirds of the way down the page in Acts 1. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. Of course, the second coming. Okay. And then I've quoted a couple of passages like uh, Philippians 2. God exalted him into the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So part of the reason that we worship Jesus is we're told to. That that's what God wants. Merely that he was, he was God, but, but in addition, God has specifically said, you, you shall worship him like you worship me. And of course, we say that when we say, you know, when we say the um, creeds. Oh, by the way, if, if you were not in church today, something exciting happened. We actually sang the doxology. Been a while. Been a while, yes. We, we, I know that the, the, us guys and commissions have talked about it. We actually had the doxology today. It may have been true this is the first time I've been in church for a couple of weeks. But it was really exciting to do that. It was getting more traditional. I'm old fashioned. What can I say? Me too. Yeah. So, anyway, that's, that's all there is in terms of the post uh, resurrection. The point of all this is to bring us to a reflection of just who Jesus is. Because these events in and of themselves are interesting, but not necessarily all that important. But, but taken as part of the story about who Jesus is, okay, they give us further, further ammunition in terms of understanding. And we're faced with that question. 
Do we really believe that Jesus was God? And that's, of course, a faith question. There, there are no, there are no, you know, that's, uh, remember, this is where we've been headed this entire course. It's just who was and is Jesus. Is he, in fact, God? You know, the church, the early church went through a whole period of discussing that. Initially, they addressed his divinity in the Council of Ephesus in 325 AD. So for 300 years, they, the quick issue wasn't resolved. They, and they finally decided he was, was divine. And, that's, and out of that came the first version of the Nicene Creed. Nicene Creed. I say first version because the version we have now is, is, has come later. It wasn't until about 125 years later that they addressed the question of Jesus being human. That was the... You know, things that we talk about and take for granted had to be settled by the church. In that case, it was only a Catholic church, of course. You know, but, but nevertheless, those issues had to be settled. So anyway, let's turn our quick attention to who was and is Jesus. Okay. I'm looking at handout 26. I've divided the handout into two, two categories in the interest of time. One is Jesus's humanity. The whole series of things. And then I'm going to talk about Jesus divinity. Again, that's just the way my engineering mind breaks it down. It, 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 it may not be how you would see it. I would invite your attention for just a second to the very end of page 12 and the top of page 13. I've given you a summary of the categories that we're talking about. And this is not the only possible category. This is what I could do in the limited time. As Jesus as human, I've talked about Jesus as a rabbi or teacher, Jesus as a prophet, Jesus as a great moral teacher, Jesus as a healer, a great healer, Jesus as the son of man, of course, we know about because of all the references in the, in the Gospels. Jesus as Messiah and or Christ. Christ, of course, was the Greek word that corresponded to the Hebrew word Messiah. Now, the important point is the mere fact that he's Messiah doesn't make him divine. It simply means he's been anointed by God. That may seem like a subtle difference, but it's an important one. Then we talk about Jesus as the herald of the good news, both, both in terms of what he says personally and what he commands the disciples to do, to broadcast the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. Okay? That's what the God, word gospel means, good news. The gospel is taken from Old English. It basically means the same thing as the good news. The good news that God was coming down on earth to take charge. We've messed it up long enough. Come. We talk about Jesus as a shepherd taking care of his flock. We see that image. We've already, remember, we had a handout on shepherd earlier, so I don't need to repeat that. And Jesus as the king of the Jews. Remember, that was one of the issues that when he went in front of Pilate, are you the king of the Jews? He didn't really answer, did he? In one place he says, my, my kingdom is not of this world. That's kind of enigmatic. What exactly does that mean? Okay. We know that he had a sign in all four of the accounts of the, of the crucifixion. He had a sign on the cross king of the Jews. So he was mocked for that. Well, and the crown of thorns. Well, and the crown of thorns also, yes. Okay? So think about that. Now, in terms of Jesus as divine, first of all, Jesus as the son of God. 
it's worth noting that that expression being so, called the king, son of God is, is other places in the Old Testament. It does not, not necessarily make Jesus divine. But the key thing that makes it divine is who said it. In other words, they, that phrase was used in the Old Testament to speak about a person who was, you know, an important religious person, son of God. But what's different about Jesus? God says it. And in the transfiguration, yes. God says it. It's not, it's not Jesus saying it, although he does say it when he's asked. But nevertheless, God has, has given him this. God said it first. God said it first. That's exactly right. The other part that I would bring, bring, your, bring your attention to is God with us. Well, Emmanuel. If you look at the handouts very early on that I gave out, that whole theme of God being with us goes all throughout the Bible. That was always God's intention. You'll see when we take a quick look at it, there's a particular passage in Deuteronomy. But we also see it, you know, in terms of, of God's instructions about the tabernacle. What was the point of the tabernacle? It was a place for God to dwell, or at least the, the spirit of God to dwell in the Holy of Holies, likewise in the temple. So this idea of God dwelling among his people goes all the way through the Bible, all the way to Revelation. In chapter 21, when the new Jerusalem comes down, he intended to make his place among his people. Now, that's not necessarily places we understand. That's God's version. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't have a house down the road that we can go to. We do. It's called he's right here. But but the point is, he, he so to what degree is Jesus? And his coming to earth, part of that promise. If God intended to come and dwell with us, can we interpret it that God intended by sending Jesus to send himself to be among us? And then, of course, at the end, he promises the Holy Spirit, the third part, the third part the of the third part of himself. That's right. Think about that. That's you know that's a powerful concept. It's you know in, for our us mere humans in the twenty first century to get our mind around that because it is it is it, it's overwhelming to think about, it. and it is absolutely a matter of faith. You can't you can't prove it. That's hard for me as an engineer. I like to prove things. One of the things that you know I've come to learn and when you talk about this stuff. I have to put all of that aside. It's, it's, it's a wholly different kind of thought process. What about Jesus as a servant of God? We're going to see very quickly that there's a whole, in, in Isaiah 53, there's a whole series of passages where, where it's talked about a servant of God will come to earth. You'll see, I've got them, I've, they're in the handout, so you, you'll see them there. What about Jesus as a savior or redeemer? Were we introduced anywhere before to the idea of a redeemer? Does anybody know? What? Well, Moses was supposed Moses? to be, uh, he was supposed to redeem okay. the Jews from Pharaoh. Okay, anybody else? He was also the, you know, all of the sacrifices that are intended to redeem you from your sin. And that's the whole idea of scapegoat, right? Yeah, the scapegoat. Take, the, take also, the sins of all the Israelites, yes. Yeah. Well, there's also that concept of the Redeemer in Job. Ah, yes. Job 19, verse 25. It's in, it's in the handout here, so you don't need to write it down. Okay? It says, I know my Redeemer lives. Okay. I will see him. 
And what about Jesus as judge? People want to pretend, you know, examine sin and then look at him to leave people of them. Well, and he just said in one of your comments before, he, He's coming when back. he was when he well, when he was talking up to Thomas about yep. you know, those of you who believed without having to see me, yep. you, you shall be saved. Also keep in mind that if you throw back to the old testament, the judge was the person who led Israel prior to the time of the king. That's true. That's a good point. So if you look back at you know, it was somebody who was there to to lead and not just settle disputes, but to, you know, to lead, to settle disputes, to try to bring people back to God, you know, things like that, that whole. So, yeah, I wonder if, as they use the word judge here, if they are going all the way back to that, or if they're merely looking at the settling of disputes aspect of it. What do we say in the creed? Judging the quick and the dead. Jesus is going to judge the quick and the dead. Remember, we talked about the about the what they referred to as the mini apocalypses. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Three different chapters. Matthew 24, Mark 14, and Luke 21. He's coming back. And he predicts coming back. And when he talks about, and it says it, we just read it earlier, about coming back on the clouds of heaven. The judge. So we can say that Jesus is the judge, right? Now, stop and think a minute. We said an awful lot about who Jesus is. The problem that we have, it's hard for us mere humans to think of somebody with that much to him. He's so much more than we can imagine. We tend to underestimate Jesus. Because we see and we, we, I mean, globally, the apostles, the people of the time, experienced him as a human. As a human. So they, With the limitations of a human, right? Right. But that's the only way we can perceive him. Right. I'm not saying we're, we're humans. We, we are not gifted with The intrinsic ability to see more than human in others. Um, that's the challenge, isn't it? That's why it's if, a faith issue. If, if, that's when it becomes a faith issue, is because Absolutely. we we can't. And and I I would going back to to Jesus as the judge. He's not judging the outward that everybody else sees. That's not the judge that I perceive. The judgment is interior. The judgment is where's your heart with what you do? That's what's getting judged is where you, where's your heart. It's not about man's law. It's about God's law. Yes. He's the judge of God's law, not man's law. And there's a Really important. Let me right. let me make an observation. You have just described how Jesus will judge. And you said it very well. The question is, what is the significance of that judgment? What's at stake? Soul. Your soul. Your mortal soul. Forever and ever. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there are two different parts of the question, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And and what you know the famous story in Matthew twenty five. Starting around verse 32. Separation Separating of the sheep, sheep, sheep from the goats. goats. We also see passages where Jesus, for example, the, the story of the of the uh, ten virgins and their lamps at the beginning of Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. the, the five that didn't have oil, they went and bought oil and came back. The bridegroom had already come. It's Jesus. He, what does he say? I don't know you. You weren't prepared. You weren't prepared. That same theme about not knowing you, you'll see I've got it referenced in a couple 
couple of places here. That's not unique to that one, one chapter. Jesus is saying, you know, they will say, Lord, Lord. I will say, I don't know you. So there's a whole lot at stake. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be one of the ones he says, I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to be I'm, up I'm there being quick, my but teeth. you understand my point. <laughs> yes, that's, that's the problem. There's a whole lot at stake. Okay, any questions about that? Let's very quickly go through the handout. I'm just going to touch on a few things. Uh, you notice that, that Jesus is referred to as a rabbi several, second, several times. Does that mean he was a rabbi? What is, what is a rabbi? A rabbi is a teacher of the law. Did Jesus qualify? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. What about Jesus as a prophet? Notice I have quoted a passage in Deuteronomy here. Where in Deuteronomy, remember what Deuteronomy was. Deuteronomy was the final sermons from Moses. Where he's predicting that, that well, say God will raise up for you a prophet like me. Listen to him. Very much analogous to the, what, it, what is said at the transfiguration. Listen to him. This, this is something I had never noticed before about this passage. This is what you asked of the Lord your God on the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the voice. We don't want to hear the voice of the Lord or see his great fire or we will die. They were so afraid of God. They want God to talk to them. So God had to send a prophet. Yes. And they still wouldn't listen. <laughs> like, he sent a bunch of prophets. He sent a bunch of prophets and they're still not listening. Was Jesus the final prophet? No. I didn't think so. Why not? Um, because too many didn't listen. I think there's going to be well, he'll come back. Let's put it that way. He won't be the same. The point back. is, he had to send himself. Yes. Okay. They're not yeah. going to listen. He's not. They're not going to listen to my prophets. I have to. I have to go yes. myself. Yes. They still won't listen to me, but I'll go. Other prophet. Several places in, in scripture that talk about a prophet without honor. I'll let you read those. They're self-explanatory. So I'm on page two. Jesus has a great moral teacher. You notice that I've just summarized that. I didn't even include a bunch of. Passages. We did. We, we've talked about Jesus' teachings, right? Sermon on the Mount, the parables, others. So there's no need to repeat them. Teaching about the apocalypse. What is the apocalypse? Does that mean at the end of the world? What does the word apocalypse mean? Anybody? Sorry? Was that you, Gail Ann? <laughs> I should know that, but right now, the explanation simply means a revelation. Right. Simply means revealing. It doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world. We, in our common English parlance, we've tended to have that word have more of that kind of meaning. But that was not what was intended. Well, if it's okay, I look at it as there's big A apocalypse and there's little A apocalypse. Okay. And in terms of the big A apocalypse, will end the world as you know it. That doesn't mean it will end it. It means it will end it as you know it. Mm -hmm. And again, it's an interior thing. Um, because if you have faith, and if you know Jesus, it will change life as you know it. Mm -hmm. 
And if you don't know Jesus, it certainly will change life. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's going to be significant. It will be significant no matter which way it goes. So, but that's the big A apocalypse. Yes. Yes. There's little A apocalypse. But that's how we've come to use them. Yes. That was not the original intent. Right. Okay. Jesus is a great healer and, and miracle worker. You notice we didn't spend any time in this course talking about Jesus' miracles or all the healings. If you want, I will send you the handouts that you would have gotten because I did handouts for those too. But we simply didn't have enough time. We know that Jesus did a lot of healings. He drove out demons. He, you know, and several times he healed on the Sabbath. Got in trouble. Got him in trouble. He also several times when he healed people said, your sins are forgiven. That also got him in trouble. Uh, yeah. Yes. So that's, you know, is that... This this may even be in the wrong place. Is that is that an evidence of his divinity? I haven't put it there. It doesn't mean it is. I, I would say that the healings, the yeah, I would, I would actually argue that this person was supposed to be divine rather than okay, because most people most can't run water to wine <laughs> or walk on water or walk on water. Or calm storm. Calm storm. Who is this man that even that even the waves and the wind listen, listen yeah. to him? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> so maybe I've got that misplaced. Maybe that belongs in the other category. Jesus says the son of David. You look at the genealogies, they all tend to emphasize that point. There are two gene genealogies in, in the gospels, in Matthew and in Luke. Now, Luke actually takes him back to Abraham. I thought Matthew did that. I thought he, the part Matthew, early part of Matthew listed like 20 generations back. I'm sorry, Abraham. David and Excuse Abraham. Excuse me, I misspoke. He Luke goes back to Adam. Luke goes back to Adam. Oh. Excuse me. Yeah, thank you. That's my mistake. You wrote it down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I would read my own notes, right? <laughs> anyway. And of course, when he arrived in, you know, what we call Palm Sunday, and he arrived in Jerusalem, you know, Hosanna to the son of David, because God had originally made a promise to David that his line would never end, his throne would never end. So they took that very literally. Again, we're looking in the first century AD. It seems a little silly in retrospect. But that was how they saw it. We have to some degree look at the at Jesus in the context of his time. Okay? We've talked about Jesus as Messiah. Well, Jesus is the Son of Man. I didn't even bother to list anything on the top of page three. I did not bother to list anything because we know we've already, I've already given you a handout about the, the various times that Jesus referred to as the Son of Man. There were just very many of them, so I don't need to repeat that. Well, doesn't that just refer to the simple story of his birth, just being the son of a, of a human? What is he remember? He took that term. Jesus referred to himself that way. Now that term originally showed up in Daniel. It was also in Ezekiel. So I think in terms of the Jewish writers that wrote the Old Testament, that was synonymous to being man. Son of man was like saying somebody was a man, a human. A human. A human. So it's interesting that Jesus would choose to refer to himself that way. If you look at the Gospels, time and time and time again, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. So I was thinking about this a while ago. Uh, last year or something like that. And one of the things that struck me was consider Jesus, the word of God, divine from before the beginning. And you know, the word, word was with God, the word was God. The fact that he stresses son of man so many times 
throughout his lifetime is actually for him the thing that is unusual, the thing that has changed. So if we were to if in fact he is God, it himself, seems a little a little bit uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, but it seems yeah, he's chosen to to right downplay mm -hmm. downplay mm -hmm. himself. Instead of that, instead of who's that guy? Oh yeah, he's the son of God. Right, um, because that's how he'd always been known by the heavenly host and by God and etc. And now he is here, and he is making a point that he is in this in, incarnation a son of man. Man, and in, the, in, you in order for the prophecy to truly be fulfilled, though, mm -hmm. he has to be human. Mm -hmm. In order for him to suffer and die, he has to be human, right. and people. His contemporaries have to believe he is human, mm -hmm. or his divinity makes no sense to them. Right. Makes no sense to us. I'm in favor of people. So when you said it was always referred, but always said about, you mean all these references over time were always that he was the son of God. That he was the son of God. If you look, you know, as open up as, as John opens, right? Uh, in the beginning, there was the word, the word was with God. The word was called God. the prologue, yeah. Right. Um, Which is repetition of Genesis. To an extent, but it's, a, it, but it's showing that Jesus existed this entire time. Right? Has always existed. Since the and beginning fact, of creation, before the beginning. Of right. So if you look at Genesis, right at the beginning of Genesis, God created the world by speaking it into existence. Mm -hmm. Hence the reference to, to the Jesus word. as the word. Ah, yeah. I never made that connection. And, yeah. and again, I, you know, for whatever reason, it was rolling around in my head that, you know, what is unusual about this time in Jesus' existence is that at this time in this incarnation, he shows up as a man. And he emphasizes that point. You know, kind of to everybody. As you point around. out, he, he can't die unless he's human. Yes. And of course, a lot of people have argued, there been there were a lot of arguments in the early church about did he really die? If he really was God, how could he die? Because mm -hmm. he needed to be fully human and fully God. See, and that's the mystery of it. That's that's where we get into stuff just way beyond our ability to fully comprehend. We can talk about it, but to just grasp it because we're not God. Only God could do that. Which seems to be a contradiction. But it isn't. And again, it's a faith issue. It's not, it, you know, it defies logic. It's a faith issue. Moving down page three, we get into the, the question of Jesus as the Messiah. And remember, that's only the anointed one. I've given you some references. Okay, where he is again in the baptism, where he's, you know, what the, so the declaration of Peter, the woman at the well. I don't know if you caught that, but there's a very famous passage in here. You know, you know where he meets the woman at the well, and it turns out that she's been married five times, and is living with a man now who's not her husband, and she has to come in the middle of the day because she's kind of an outcast in her society. Mostly the women would come in the early morning when it was cool. Right at the top of page four. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. He made it pretty clear that he's the Messiah, both in terms of how they understand it at the human level, aside from, from the whole question of his relationship to God. Again, the, the herald of the good news. I didn't really put a lot of time into that, but I've already mentioned that all the places where Jesus either says, repent for the kingdom of, of heaven is near, heaven or, or God, heaven for the kingdom of God. Remember that oftentimes he used that phraseology 
about the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven when he was telling a parable. Not every time, but oftentimes you'd say the, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like. Okay? So there are a lot of places where that comes up. The same is true of Jesus as a shepherd. You know, there you've got a whole handout on shepherding, shepherds and lambs. Okay. Because that whole idea of remember, before Jesus, God was the shepherd. There are a number of passages where God talks about shepherds, and he criticizes the shepherds of his people, talking about the leadership of the Israelites. So I didn't dwell a lot on that, just let you. And of course, the famous story about the lost sheep. The lost sheep talks about Jesus as a shepherd. And what does he say in, in uh, Luke 15? Story of the, the end of that story. The parable of the lost sheep at the bottom of page four, at the top of page five. More rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Right. Than over the 99. Right. He also talks himself about himself being the gate, referring to the shepherd watching over the flock. Watching over the flock, and he lays down at the gate the to gate. keep the, the predators out. Yeah, and to keep them from wandering away. Yeah. Because you're not very smart. No, we're not. <laughs> right, at the bottom of page five, we're talking about the king of the Jews. We know that that's, you know, phrase came up, so we don't need to dwell on that. Notice in particular, Jesus coming in what we call Palm Sunday. He comes to Jerusalem as king. Again, we get into this whole question of how the Israelites, how their perception of who he was. And of course, they're, they're giving him hosannas. And they're putting palm branches down and putting cloaks down at the beginning of the week. But boy, does it take a turn over a period of one week. Got it? Because, of course, they did think of him as coming to you know, get rid of the Romans, right? That brings us to the bottom of page six to the question of divinity. I'll bring back a passage which we've talked about before, but it's worth re reinforcing. At the very bottom of the page, it says John 8.58. It should say John 8.54 through 58. Because there's more than one verse. If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as God, as your God, is the one who glorifies me. I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw, he saw it and was glad. Then they asked him, and you are not yet you are not yet fifty years old. They said to him, "You have seen Abraham." Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, "Before Abraham was born, I am." What does that point to? Well, that's what God said to the Israelites. I am. Well, he said it first of all to Moses, right? Yes, to Moses. He said, Moses I said, am. who shall I tell the sent? I am. Tell him I am. Okay. So, so this is a very profound claim. Yahweh. He's saying he's Yahweh, right? That's what he's saying. You can imagine they tried to they tried to grab him and stone him right there in that yeah position. I was gonna say yeah he that kind of walked away we go on we look at things like the you know the annunciation and where he's supposed to be he's supposed to be Emmanuel God with us we talked about that already okay and the word became flesh that was what you were mentioning, Chris. This is right after what you what you enunciated. Yeah. Okay. The baptism of Jesus. Moving on. 
It's again self explanatory, the transfiguration. Again, if, if God says this is his son, who are we to argue with? Do we believe that? Because, of course, we only know through the Bible. So the question is, do we believe the words in the Bible that says, God said, this is my son? Speaking of anybody in the Bible who has basically won the argument with God. Nope. No. Jacob, no. Jacob wrestled with God, remember? Right. But, but did he so win? Who, who has argued with God and won? Right? And God said, I'm oh, sorry, I was wrong. No. <laughs> and happen. he can be negotiated with. Remember what yeah. Abraham does with, with love regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. so if you, first of all, if there are 50, you eventually get to down to 10 righteous people. Mm -hmm. So he's negotiating. Okay. Notice John 10 30 at the bottom, about two thirds of the way down the page. I and the Father are one. That's a pretty powerful statement. I and the Father are one. That's a precursor. What do you think subsequently they got the idea of the Trinity? Some ideas like this embedded, it's, it doesn't say Trinity. Yeah, but it's ideas. Well, hey, it's it's I and the, the Father truth. are one, and then later on he says, "I will send you the Advocate." Yes. The Holy Spirit. Yes. So there's your there's the third aspect of of God. Now let me pose a question to you. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. Are you familiar with what's called the colloquy colloquy clause? No. You look at the Nicene Creed. It says about the Holy Ghost, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, not just from God, but from, from, from the Father and Jesus. This particular phrase caused a great schism between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church in 1054. Okay. Argument over that particular point of theology. I mean, there's some other things. Yeah. Including who was going to be in charge, right? Yeah. But it's never just one thing. No, no. It's not, you know. I heard a in a sermon several years ago um, a description of it that always struck me, which was, you know, God the Father, Jesus is God the Son, and the Holy Spirit is God is God the love that flows between them. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit itself is. In the, in the passage in John, where he promises to send an advocate, he will say, I will ask the Father to send an advocate. Not that he will do it. He will ask the Father. So just something to think about. Okay, down at the bottom, we get, you know, uh, we get into the trial of the Sanhedrin. Again, we've talked about this before, so I, I won't spend a lot of time on it. But you'll notice the last line here. From now, on, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of the heavens. Sitting at the right hand. Again, this is another reason to believe that. And the same thing, something like that is in all four Gospels. Okay. Then we get to the crucifixion. Several places in the crucifixion. The centurion who was guarding Jesus says, surely he was the son of God. So he, somehow he had that revelation standing there at the foot of the cross. And that's, you know, that's both in Matthew and Mark and that slightly different version in Luke. I've mentioned before about God with us. Notice what I've, I've given you a, an Old Testament quote from Leviticus 26. I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of the yoke and enabled you to walk with your heads held high. So he said right from early on, 
he was going to put his residence in his people. So that, as I said, is a theme that goes all the way back. Jesus as Savior and Redeemer, at the bottom of page 10. And we've talked about this. I mentioned, I mentioned what's called the Nunc Dimittis. This is Simeon in Luke, in Simeon in the temple, no prophet. Okay? Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. He's speaking about the importance of Jesus. Jesus has been presented at the temple. Unlike Matthew, where Jesus goes off to Egypt, and we talked about that. In Luke, Jesus stays in Jerusalem, and after the eighth day, as required by the law, he's presented at the temple. Because remember, he's the firstborn. Jesus said you will present, or excuse me, God said you will present your firstborn, all firstborn to me. Dedicate them to me. So Mary and Joseph did what was required and took Jesus to the temple. And that's where they ran into Simeon. And Simeon was a, an old prophet that was living there. And then the prophet is an addition. I don't have that specifically. Then we at the bottom of page 10, John 29 through 36. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the sin of the world. Anyway, we've run out of time. The point I would ask you to consider is we we have the temptation to want to simplify Jesus. One of the things that this shows you is that you can't, he's just so much to it. Well, it's just like you can't simplify God either. You can't simplify God either. Yes, absolutely. It's the same point. Any questions about that? Any comments? I hit you with a lot of stuff as usual. You've been very patient. Hopefully, hopefully it, it, it stimulates some thoughts in your head in terms of a fresh perspective on the Gospels and who Jesus is and was and still is. Okay. Just uh, hopefully that you just think about it in those terms. It's not important that you remember all of this, but that you get an overall concept. This is much bigger than, than any of us can imagine. Any questions or comments? Any final comments? No, but thank you for yeah. sharing. Thank you. All your work and putting together all these handouts. Yeah, most welcome. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to see it put together in this way and side by side with the different gospels. Right, and, exactly. You know, all throughout. Yeah. Thank you. You're very kind. Do you out there in Zoom land, do you have any comments? No. Thanks, Bob. You're very Just welcome. Just a thanks, Bob. You're very welcome, Pat. When do we reconvene? Thank you, Bob. Bob. Yeah, just so you know, if you're inclined, the next class will be in September. I think Steve Freeman is going to teach it. I think he's going to do the so-called Catholic letters, the letters after the letters of Paul, uh, James, Titus, etc. Okay, the letters of John, the book of Hebrews. He's, do, he's doing acts too, isn't he? No, he's not doing acts. Now he may touch on it, but that was supposedly my responsibility. Oh. The way we divided it up. I'm not aware. Now he may he obviously it's very difficult to completely segregate all this. And he may choose to draw it in. But that's not the assignment that he made for himself. And then there's and then somehow he and Peter are going to deal with Revelation. I'm not sure whether they're going to do it together, but the point is those are that's what's left to complete the original charge, which from, from uh, Reggie was to cover the entire Bible. So that's essentially what we've got left. 
So I expect that to be two sessions starting in mid-September, finishing up before Christmas. My sister just did a two-week trip to Greece and Turkey. And she's following um, parts of Paul's missionary journeys. Oh, so I'm Corin, good. Ephesus actually did a side trip. With, they had a side trip with Patmos where John wrote Revelation. Um, where else? I don't, I don't even know where else. But that's, you know. Oh, they see where Adam. Mary lived in, in uh, Ephesus? I think so, yeah. They've got a tourist place. Supposedly, yep. it was the home of Mary. Okay, you know, she left the Holy Land with John. Remember, in the, at, at the cross, Jesus says, Woman, see your son, son see mother. your mother. He sort of handed over responsibility to his mother to John. For his mother? For his mother, yes. And the tradition is that he took her to Ephesus. And that she died in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's the trick. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Let me let me just close this with a prayer. <clears throat> I'm going to again borrow from the service. If you have not seen the online service, and there seems to be a problem with the website about this, if you have not seen it, let me know because I can I can tell you how to get to it. Okay, and it's you really very easy, huh? Can you email me the link? Certainly, I mean, if you wanted it, well, anybody who else wants it. The reason I mention it is that, that Lauren, in her swan song, leaving us, really did a wonderful job today. I happened to have the opportunity to hear her at the 1115 service. But I would just urge you to, to, to look at that. And, and she talks about the whole question of friendship. And that's really what Jesus said, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a shame that, that she's leaving. And hopefully, hopefully in some way we will see her again because I'm going to use her closing prayer, if I may. Eternal God, whose steadfast love for us is from everlasting to everlasting, we give you thanks for cherished memories and commend one another into your care as we move in new directions. Keep us one in your love forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate your patience with me. And, uh, thank you, Bob. We'll all around the church. Thank you. One thing nice is we'll see each other as time goes on. We'll see each other here. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Take it right off. All right. Thank you, and thanks for letting the interlopers come too. Oh, you're never. There are no interlopers. No such thing. Just seekers. Mm -hmm. Just seekers. Andy, work on site. Take care. Oh, well, sometimes, you know, when I've been sitting, yeah. we go out to do it. Take care, guys. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Standing up at the end after dinner. It's like, please, please work. <laughs> <laughs> I went to. Um, oh, I'm telling you, I'm about faith. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh my goodness, yes. There are some days when I feel every year and other days where eh, not so much. <laughs> days like this when it's hot and humid and sticky. Well, I guess we get a 20 degree break. Yes, we do. I got into my car to come here. I said in my car that it was 100 degrees outside. It's unusually hot for this country. And then when it I'm came worried. down a little bit after the car was running. Yeah, I wore a jacket because you never know what the, the air conditioning is. Yes. Condition is yes. It's just But I did get, I got a lot of things planted, so I'm not going to have it for you. Well, well, part of my dirt therapy plan. <laughs> you guys are out. See ya. Yes, thank you again. You're very welcome. Very helpful. I look forward to seeing you in the fall. Thank you very much. Have See you, Barbara. Have a good summer. You too. If you're going to send out that link, you might just send it to all of us. Okay. I can do that. It literally takes five minutes, three okay. minutes. Yes, I will do that.